Szanowni Państwo, zanim oddam głos pani komisarz Tyson, pozwolę sobie odczytać jeszcze jeden list skierowany do uczestników kongresu, którego autorką jest pani komisarz Elżbieta Bieńkowska. Szanowni Państwo, pragnę podziękować organizatorom za zaproszenie na trzeci Europejski Kongres Mobilności Pracy. Inne zobowiązania uniemożliwiły mi niestety uczestnictwo w dzisiejszych obradach wśród tak znakomitego grona polityków i ekspertów. Chcę jednak zapewnić o istotnym miejscu, jakie zajmuje poruszana dziś tematyka w moich działaniach jako komisarza do spraw rynku wewnętrznego, przemysłu, przedsiębiorczości oraz małych i średnich przedsiębiorstw. Pan przewodniczący Jean-Claude Juncker uczynił mobilność pracy jednym z celów które powinna promować nowa komisja. Podkreślił też, że wspólny rynek jest największym atutem Europy w stawianiu czoła wyzwaniom globalizacji oraz, że kluczowym filarem tego rynku jest swoboda przepływu pracowników. Dziś zaszczyca Państwa swoją obecnością pani komisarz Marian Tyson, odpowiedzialna w Komisji Europejskiej za zatrudnienie sprawy społeczne, umiejętności oraz mobilność pracowników. Marien dowodzi również niezwykle ważnym pracom nad pakietem dotyczącym mobilności pracy. Współpracujemy z komisarz Tyson ze względu na wzajemne oddziaływania i powiązania niektórych aspektów naszych polityk. Europejczycy powinni mieć możliwość pracy tam, gdzie ich kompetencje oraz wola przedsiębiorczości są przydatne, poszukiwane i doceniane. Dlatego chcę przyczynić się do wypracowania nowej strategii, która umożliwi realizację tych celów. Strategii, która będzie zmierzać do pełnego wykorzystania potencjału rynku wewnętrznego. Strategii, która będzie częściowo, częścią szeroko zakrojonych wysiłków komisji w celu stymulowania wzrostu, tworzenia miejsc pracy oraz zwiększenia konkurencyjności Unii Europejskiej. Codziennie informowana jestem o tym, że świadczenie usług ponadgranicznych, zakładanie przedsiębiorstw w innych państwach członkowskich i rekrutacja pracowników wykształconych w innych częściach Unii Europejskiej pozostają nadal bardzo skomplikowane. Wierzę, że odpowiedzią na te i wiele innych wyzwań, w tym dotyczących mobilności pracy, jest prawidłowe funkcjonowanie wspólnego rynku. Do tego niezbędne jest ciągłe identyfikowanie barier ograniczających swobody wspólnego rynku oraz poszukiwanie jak najlepszych metod zapobiegania i usuwania przeszkód. W tym celu koncentruje się na wykorzystaniu potencjału obowiązującego prawa, i czerpaniu z repertuaru narzędzi, które mamy do dyspozycji, na przykład system uznawania kwalifikacji zawodowych lub zmodernizowane ramy prawne dotyczące zamówień publicznych. Uwzględniam przy tym szeroką sytuację małych, yy, przepraszam, szczególną sytuację małych i średnich przedsiębiorstw. Wiem, jak ważne jest uproszczenie procedur administracyjnych dotyczących rozszerzenia działalności na rynku wewnętrznym, Oczywiście z zachowaniem odpowiednich mechanizmów kontrolnych. Widzę również niebezpieczeństwo w nieuzasadnionych działaniach protekcjonistycznych, które dzielą rynek i zapobiegają wzrostowi. Wyzwania stojące przed nami są liczne i ogromne. Kryzys finansowy i gospodarczy ostatnich lat wykazał jednak, że potrzebujemy więcej Europy, aby rozwiązać nasze problemy konkurencyjności. Musimy wykorzystać szansę, jaką daje nam między innymi wspólny rynek. Kompleksowa strategia rozwiązań musi jednak być odpowiednio wyważona i uwzględniać szereg argumentów. Fundamentalne dla dorobku Unii Europejskiej prawa osób objętych mobilnością pracy i swobody rynkowe muszą się wzmacniać i wspierać nawzajem. Jestem przekonana, że kongres stworzy wspaniałą okazję do wymiany i wysłuchania doświadczeń, oczekiwań i przemyśleń, które będą pomocne w kreowaniu dalszych inicjatyw 
i opracowywaniu odpowiedzi na trudności, które dotykają nasze przedsiębiorstwa, usługodawców i pracowników. Życząc Państwu owocnej dyskusji, dziękuję za uwagę. Elżbieta Bieńkowska. Dziękuję w imieniu Pani Komisarz. A teraz uprzejmie proszę o zabranie głosu Panią Komisarz Marian Tyson. Dear Minister, Mr. Advocate General, ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful to the organizers, the University of Economics of Krakow and the Labor Mobility Initiative for inviting me to address you especially in this beautiful royal city. The cooperation with the organizers has been exemplary. Today, in the elevator, I learned why, and I will let you in in a little secret, Professor Benio and myself have a common history. We studied both at the university, the Catholic University in Leuven, had the same professors, same friends, same values. So I feel already much at home here in this, again, beautiful city. I welcome the chance to talk to you about labor mobility. I know this is an important topic for you here in Poland. It is an important topic to many people and businesses everywhere in Europe. No matter where I go, no matter where my interlocutors are entrepreneurs, workers, politicians or ordinary people, they all seem to have strong views on labor mobility. And those views are not necessarily aligned. And yet, I'm deeply convinced that ultimately, we share the same interests. This is why we need to debate this topic, listen to each other's views, and found, find common ground. Only then will we be able to move forward instead of being stuck or even falling back on what has been achieved. This is why I am here with you today to listen, to share some of my own views, and to engage with you in an open and frank debate. Let me start by sharing some of my thoughts with you. I will get to the specific topic of labor mobility in a minute, but allow me first to put this topic in a broader policy context. Throughout my political career, both as a member of the European Parliament as and a politician in my home country, Belgium, I have been a fierce promoter of the internal market. For decades, the internal market has created opportunities and brought growth and welfare throughout the European Union, to the north and the south, to the west and the east. I know that Poland has always been a strong supporter and a contributor to the internal market, and this was also one of the political priorities during the Polish presidency of the Council in 2011. And now that the European Union is going through difficult economic times, now that economic convergence between the European member states is going down instead of up, it is obvious to me that we need the internal market more than ever. We need more internal market, not less, and this is why it is a priority for this Commission to deepen the internal market. But what does deepening the internal market mean? In my view, it is absolutely essential that we work on two fronts. First, we must remove the remaining obstacles. This will not happen by itself. It will require continuous effort and enforcement action from the Commission and the Member States. Secondly, we must gradually come to more commonality in the rules and parameters that govern 
our national markets. This is true for the energy union that we are trying to create, for the digital single market, as well as for the banking union. It is true for goods, for services, and for capital. And it is also true for the free movement of workers. Deepening the internal market labor, uh, the internal labor market means removing remaining obstacles to free movement of workers and gradually elaborating the common set of minimum rights that apply to all workers across the European Union. If both go hand in hand, they can become a virtuous circle of mutually reinforcing powers. Let me illustrate this based on a concrete example. The common European rules on food safety facilitate free movement of food products. They make it easier for citizens to trust important goods because they know that these goods meet the same health and safety standards as locally produced food. Conversely, they make it more difficult for member states to justify national protection measures and hence easier for producers to export their goods. This equates to a mutually reinforcing interaction between the free movement and common standards of protection. But the balance must be there. Removing barriers without developing common rules is not a sustainable policy proposition. And what does this mean for labor mobility? It means in this area too, our approach must be balanced. If we let workers circulate freely from one member state to the other, without commonly agreed rules of the game, it would not work. It would lead to disputes, to abuses, to unilateral measures introduced by some, disputed by others. This is why we have detailed rules on the coordination of social security system. And this is why in 1996, the European Union introduced the posting of workers directive, seeking a fair balance between the interests of the workers concerned, of the service providers and of the local businesses in the recipient countries. The question today is whether these rules are still fit for purpose. And this, bring me, this brings me to the mobility package. The mobility package which we are currently preparing in the European Commission and which we intend to bring forward by the end of the year. The objective is threefold. As I hope I have made clear before, the free movement of workers and the freedom, of, uh, the freedom to provide services are not up to discussion. This being said, we cannot and should not turn a blind eye on the issues that labor mobility gives rise to, both in the countries of destination and in the countries of origin. In order to respond to citizens' concerns and to inform our policymaking, we need a correct picture of the situation based on fact and figures and not on emotions. And this is where I, seek a first, where I see a, a first task for us as European Commission to analyze and report objectively on mobility flows and their consequences on national labor markets and social security systems, both in sending and receiving countries. We may find out that the perception does not always correspond to the reality. Our second priority will be to prevent errors, abuse and fraud. This is not only in the interest of the receiving countries, but also in the interest of the origin countries. I will come back on this in a minute. But perhaps we need to go beyond enforcement and also take another close look at some key provisions of the existing rules. If they are not longer responding to the economic and social challenges of today, we may need to update them. 
Let me turn to each of these points in more detail, starting with the factual analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, only 8.1 million European citizens out of over half a billion live and work in a member country other than their own. That makes only 3.3% of our total workforce. They are not a homogeneous group. 41% have a tertiary education and that percentage is growing. The figures for workers posted in connection with the provision of services across borders are also worth taking a look at. According to the latest official European statistics available, some 1.3 million posted, uh, posting operations took place in 2013. That was an increase of 27% on 2010, but still involved only 0.6% of the total employed population aged 15 to 64 in the European Union. In absolute terms, the three main sending states were Poland, Germany and France, and the three main receiving member states were Germany, France and Belgium. Let's now zoom in on the situation here in Poland. In 2013, there were 1.9 million Polish citizens living in another member state, accounting for 14% of all mobile European citizens. Most mobile Polish citizens live and work in the United Kingdom, 718,000, Germany, 566,000, and Ireland, 120,000. In percentage terms, the Polish mobile citizens represent 3.9% of the labor force of Ireland, 1.4% of the labor force in the UK, 0.8% uh, in Austria, and 0.7% of the working force in Germany. By contrast, there were only 23,000 mobile European citizens living in Poland. But there are also many non-European citizens living and working in Poland, and many of whose activity is not declared. Undeclared work in total has been estimated to have accounted for between 12 and 15% of Poland's GDP from 1995 to 2006, compared with an EU27 average of 7.2%. According to the latest data on portable A1 forms, in 2013, Poland was the top net sender of posted workers, having sent 248,000 workers more than it received. In total, Poland posted 263,000 workers to other European member states, mostly Germany, 149,000 people, France, 31,000, and Belgium, 23,000. Notice that 48% of the Polish workers work in the construction sector. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the numbers. But we cannot limit our analysis of the situation to statistics. We also have to look closely at the impact of mobility. On the positive side, evidence points strongly to the economic benefits of labor mobility. It provides broader economic opportunities, helps correcting imbalances between high and low employment regions by matching labor supply with demand. It contributes to job creation opportunities and promotes economic growth and competitiveness. Labor mobility helps to address skills mismatches across borders. It promotes the dissemination of knowledge and innovation across the European Union. However, in particular, when concentrated geographically, 
it may also cause disruptions. I'm thinking of communities in the countries of origin who may see many of their young and most highly skilled workers leaving. This raises legitimate questions about the medium to long-term impact of aging populations and shrinking workforces on GDP, the cost of educating those who leave, and how to promote circular migration. And of communities in the host countries who may feel overwhelmed by the sudden influx of large numbers of mobile European workers and their families. We cannot turn a blind eye on these issues, but we must analyze the facts and consider rationally how to best address them. Incidentally, these are issues which do not only rise on a European scale. They may exist also within member states. Poland, for example, would, from an economic viewpoint, clearly benefit from more geographical mobility between regions with very different labor conditions inside the country. But still, that labor mobility appears not so easy to bring about and could give rise to local issues such as impact on real estate prices and local social services. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned, our second priority is to prevent errors, abuse and fraud in the context of labour mobility. For the internal market to work, it must be based on clear rules which are fair, well understood and applied in practice. Remember my example of food safety and think of the impact that one scandal of contaminated food can have. Beyond the direct harm it causes, it can take ages to restore people's trust. No, no matter how many safe food products have crossed borders at the same time, one rotten apple spoils the whole barrel. It is the same with free movement of workers. No matter how many people play by the rules, one well mediatized fraud case undermines people's trust in the fairness of free movement of workers in general. That is why enforcement is so much in the common interest of all countries, the receiving ones as well as the net senders. The enforcement directive on the posting of workers adopted last year will be important here. It lists qualitative criteria characterizing both the temporary nature inherent in the notion of posting and the existence of a genuine link between the employer and the member state of establishment. These provisions provide the member states with tools to fight the abuses by letterbox companies. The directive will also make information on the applicable terms and conditions of employment much more easily available in each member state. Knowing your rights is a precondition for getting them respected and knowing your obligations is a prerequisite for honoring them. The enforcement directive will also introduce direct subcontracting liability in the construction sector. Member states may choose to apply the subcontracting liability further down in the supply chain and may extend it to other sectors. These liability mechanisms can play an important role in securing workers' rights. And the Enforcement Directive establishes a list of national control measures that the Member States may apply to monitor compliance with the Posting of Workers Directive and the Enforcement Directive. This may entail an obligation for the posting companies to make a simple prior declaration to the authorities in the receiving country, to keep basic documents such as posted workers' employment contracts, pay slips, and timesheets available at the workplace, to designate a contact person for liaising with the enforcement authorities in the receiving country. 
The enforcement directive will also intensify cooperation between national authorities with a view to exchange information and enforce the rules together. This is a point that I personally attach a lot of importance to. Posting, by definition, always involves a cross-border element. To assess the regularity of posting across different member states, it will almost certainly be necessary to assemble information held by the authorities in different member states. We must find efficient and effective ways to do this, and I count on all national authorities to play their role. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be aware that the Commission has recently referred a member state to court for enabling its enforcement authorities unilaterally to declare a, a one form issued by another member state void. Such unilateral actions are not acceptable in the European Union. There are proper procedures for cooperation in place, which is why we did not hesitate to take the case to court. Nevertheless, it is all member states' common responsibility to make sure that these procedures work. Transposing the enforcement directive on posting swiftly and properly into member states' legislation is therefore crucial. We shall continue to work closely with the member states to ensure that this is done. Transposing the enforcement directive is not only a matter of adopting the necessary legislative measures, it is also a measure of ensuring that the competent authorities have the necessary resources to do the work. I count on Poland as one of the member states with the highest number of posted workers sent to other member states to fully play its role here. I invite you, the business community, enforcement agencies and politicians of Poland not to see legitimate actions of other member states to enforce the posting of rules as hostile acts. They are your allies. In the short run, they make sure that you, who play by the rules, do not face unfair competition from those who don't. And in the long run, they help ensuring that European citizens trust and support free movement of workers. Ladies and gentlemen, the same is true for the fight against undeclared work. A second instrument in our fight against abuse and fraud is the proposed European platform on undeclared work, a problem that you also know here in Poland. This platform will bring together various national enforcement authorities, such as the labor inspectorates and the social security and tax authorities, with a view to preventing and deterring undeclared work. In those member states where good cooperation exists between those authorities, the administrative burden on businesses and workers can often be reduced. Once established, it will involve sharing information and best practice, developing expertise and training, and supporting practical cross-border cooperation. I hope that I can count on Poland's support for a rapid adoption uh, by the co-legislators of the proposed decision on the establishment of this platform. Ladies and gentlemen, the labor mobility package will not only aim to provide a factual description and rational analysis of labor mobility in the European Union and examine how we can further support national authorities in the fight against abuses and fraud. As I mentioned, we will also assess whether the existing rules are still fit for purpose and, where needed, propose adjustments. As regards the 1996 Posting of Workers Directive, 
President Juncker has announced in his political guidelines that we would conduct a targeted review. This does not necessarily mean a revision. I am aware from my time in the European Parliament that it was not easy to come to an agreement on the enforcement directive and I will certainly not take the decision to open up the basic posting directive lightly. In any event, if at all, we will propose to open up the basic directive, it will not be to put the basic principles on free movement up for discussion. The key objective of the posting directive to aim for a balance between the interests of the worker, of the service provider and of the local business must remain intact. It is only when the rules appear to give rise to many, to too many uncertainties or abuses that we could consider amending them. I notice that fundamental disputes continue to exist today, for example, about the concept of posting in the transport sector. And I'm coming from Riga. Yesterday and the day before, we had a meeting with the national ministers for labor and employment, and I used this occasion to discuss this item with the representative of Germany. I can tell you that if an amendment of the directive can bring more legal certainty in the interest of businesses and workers, we should consider it. This too can be part of deepening the internal market. The European rules on the coordination of social security systems is another set of rules that we are taking another look at. The coordination rules have always been an important instrument to facilitate cross-border mobility of European workers and their family. They aim to ensure that mobile European citizens do not lose their social security protection and that one member state and only one member state is always responsible for the social security protection of the individual citizen. But we need to ensure that the rules reflect the changes in the economy and society and, as I said before, that they are seen as being fair by citizens and political leaders. I approach this matter with an open mind and we are eager to listen to the concerns and the proposals of the member states and citizens. It is clear that the issues raised do not have easy answers. The fact that the social security systems of the member states vary so substantially does not always make it easy to find common ground. Let's take family benefits. As you know, where workers are entitled to family benefits, they will, under the current rules, focused on the lex loci laboris principle, which underpins the regulation. Lex locis laboris, you know that this means that it is in principle the law of the country in which the person works that, it, uh, that the law is applicable. So under the current rules, workers and their family receive the same amounts of benefits as their fellow workers, regardless of whether their children live in the same country or another. However, in the national jurisdictions of most member states, family allowances are residence-based and tax-financed. Amounts of benefits vary moreover substantially between member states in absolute figures and in percentage of GDP. I understand, for instance, that child and family benefits in Poland account for 0.8% of GDP. This is the lowest percentage in the European Union. Under the current circumstances, are the existing rules fair? Or should the 
the place of residence of the children be decisive, either for determining which member state is competent in first instance, or for determining the amount of the benefit. As regards unemployment benefits, as you know, the last country of employment is responsible for paying them. This is true even if the worker has worked and paid social security contributions in another member state all his or her life, and for instance, for only two weeks in the last country of employment. In such cases, can you legitimately question whether a worker should not have spent a minimum amount of time, say one month or three months in the last country of employment before being entitled to unemployment benefits there? Those are just two examples of questions that could be asked and are being asked on the subject of social security coordination rules in the European Union. Luckily, there are also some easier issues. For example, with more and more member states introducing benefits for long-term care in their social security systems, a trend which the European Commission encourages in view of the aging of the population, it seems fairly obvious that those benefits need to be covered explicitly in the European coordination rules. As I said, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a listening mode and we don't have the answers to those questions yet. That is why we want to debate on the subject, to explore options and to see whether the rules need updating. We shall only take a decision on how to proceed as regards changing the current rules at the end of the year. In the meantime, we are conducting a thorough impact assessment to ensure that we understand the effects of any change to the current rules. So I am eager to hear the views of the Member States, the European Parliament, the social partners and other stakeholders to ensure that our decision is an informed one. Ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely believe that labour mobility is an opportunity, not a threat. To the extent that you need to be convinced, I hope I have been able to convince you of that today. We must not backtrack on the internal market now that we need it more than ever. We must deepen it. Free movement of workers expands the opportunities available to individual workers and employers. Like all freedoms, it must be tempered with concern for its impact on others. Of particular concern are its impact on the social protection of the workers and on the level playing field with the local businesses. This is not new. It has always been at the heart of the European Union's internal market policy. If the European Union does not pay attention to maintaining the balance, it risks undermining the European citizens' support for the internal market and even for the European project as a whole. And that is why the Commission is determined to support freedom of movement and freedom to provide services across borders and to make sure that they take place in, a lawful, in lawful and fair conditions. But achieving a balanced approach to labour mobility and making sure it is fair is not something the Commission can do on its own. The member states, the social partners, enforcement agencies, civil society and individual citizens can and must do all their bit. Tackling abuses and fraud, properly protecting the rights of posted workers, and making sure social security contributions are paid are in Poland's interest just as much as they are in that of other member states. It is in Poland's short-term interest and in its long-term interest, taking into account that Poland is in the center, in the heart of the European Union's internal market. 
We need to see how to do this together, how to explain it to our fellow Europeans, and then how to enforce the rules that we have agreed. Poland's contribution to achieving a fairer internal market will be hugely important. I thank you. Dziękuję.